I'm in Washington, D.C. Um, it's, it's, it's supposedly a lockdown, but it's not really being enforced in any real way. Um, so it's really a voluntary process. And I'm doing just fine. I work from home. I'm a writer and I do, you know, if I'm not in the field, I'm already here. So basically the principal difference for me is that my friends don't come over and drink all my beer. Difference, um, you know, friends of mine who are able to work or still be paid because they're, you know, public school teachers or they worked for the city, for, the, for example, uh, they're doing far better than they ever have because they finally get a break from this um, brutal schedule of, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. work and then having to, you know, if you're a teacher, then you have to go meet with parents after. So they're able to do creative things. And I think a lot of people are reflecting on how um, insane our uh, concept of labor is. Um, then there are other people who've just been wiped out because uh, they're part of the gig economy. Um, they are, you know, what fitness instructors, people who have to be in person with someone who uh, people are realizing that their employer based health care is completely worthless and that they do need universal health care. Uh, we uh, it's still controversial in this country for a politician to demand the same health care system that every industrialized country got 50 years ago and that, you know, Nicaragua and Cuba currently have. So um, a lot of the political assumptions that many people who weren't previously politicized had are being upended. Um, and I think there is a process of radicalization that's quietly taking place. One of the more disturbing aspects of the COVID crisis in a city like Washington, D.C. or New York or Chicago is that it's disproportionately affecting people of color, black people. Um, I live in a predominantly black neighborhood. Uh, you know, you see people gathered on the streets. Uh, the police have recently come out and started to try to kind of intimidate them out of the streets. But these are often people who have nowhere else to go. People gather here just to have a sense of community and they can't afford to go to a bar or a nightclub. So the streets are always full here because that's just what people do. Um, and people turn to each other in, you know, an impoverished, neglected area like this in times of need. Um, so it's very difficult for people um, to have the sense of community fractured. Um, and then finally, there's the issue of jails and prisons. A mass incarceration in the U.S. is a product of a racist... Uh, justice system and um, it's made to basically target the poor and classes racialized in the US. So coronavirus has kind of become a weapon of class warfare where um, maximum security prisons are being hit hard because the guards have brought it in and there's no will among the governors to let um, the inmates out because of our tough on crime culture. This even includes Democrats who've campaigned on you know, cr um, criminal justice reform and prison reform. And uh, that means that people are basically, who've been sentenced to long terms, including elderly people in prison, are uh, facing a potential death sentence right now. Then the jails and cities here, um, Cook County Jail in Chicago, the DC jail here, they're filthy. They're completely unhygienic. Um, and, you know, you're in a six by nine cell with a toilet with like a spout of water on top of the toilet. That's the only thing you have to drink. There's no soap. You're put in, you know, cages with 50 people at a time. There's no reforms being made. Nothing's being done differently. And many judges aren't being given instructions to, for example, not throw someone in jail for three days because they just happen to have a small amount of marijuana or whatever it is, a small amount of narcotics. Um, and th those, those will become the ultimate incubators of coronavirus and it will spread back into communities where the inmates come from, poor communities of color. So once again, we're looking at coronavirus becoming sort of an instrument of class warfare. And then finally, just looking at the national perspective, the virus has revealed the U.S. to not really be a real country. Um, states are forced to bid against one another for ventilators. And the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, which should be buying all the ventilators and then providing them to states according to need, which is kind of a socialist idea. Mm -hmm. It isn't doing it. Uh, the Trump administration is basically letting private companies uh, take the lead here and they're standing back. And then states are basically desperately fighting one another, even though the rates of infection in, from state to state are different. 
and there's no guidance for the state. So the state of Alabama, which is a red state where you have all these people who want to go to mega church together and they believe it's all a hoax to get Donald Trump. There's no lockdown. There's n nothing, almost nothing is taking place there. Same in Georgia as well. So these states are going to have much higher rates of infection in a few weeks than California, uh, which has a very uh, progressive, uh, you know, relatively speaking, progressive leadership in place. Uh, the federal government, the Trump administration is really doing nothing. Once We're just not a real country anymore. Absolutely. Um, that's why New York was so eager to accept a shipment from China of ventilators, um, a, a shipment of ventilators from a Russian company that was put under U.S. sanctions in 2014 uh, arrived last week, which shows how sanctions actually do affect the general public. Um, but there are just simply, first of all, there's no production of ventilators in the U.S. Production has been outsourced to China. And then the federal government's um, strategic um, strategic reserve of personal protective equipment and ventilators and things like that has been completely depleted, not just under the Trump administration, but after the um, SARS and Ebola crises, the Obama administration didn't repl replenish the strategic reserve. So the, the whole country has been caught on the back foot and New York has felt it most strongly. And, you know, it's Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, who's actively trying to cut health benefits to poor people. I mean, he is one of the most aggressive budget cutters. He's basically a moderate Republican. He's now badgering, uh, hammering the federal government for its failure to buy up loads of ventilators and give them to New York, which, you know, completely contravenes the whole understanding of government that prevails in Albany and in Washington, where they basically let the market guide the whole situation. Um, it, it, it is, it, it's exposed, the, the, this crisis has exposed everything that's wrong with American capitalism, down to the fact that doctors, nurses, people on the front lines are being asked to recycle their N95 masks. Uh, every week, they're lucky to get a new one. And in some cases, those who are infected, if they, if they recycle or repurpose their mask, they can infect new people. So the masks basically are worthless. We're seeing people walk off the job because they can't get masks. Nurses walk off the job. Um, this is it's, it's a crisis that has to do also with the supply chain, just because everything has been put in the hands of Chinese factories. And when the crisis hit China, the factories, because China actually has an effective central government, the factories were repurposed to produce the things that China needed, like ventilators and personal protective equipment, to succeed and turn the corner on the crisis. And that meant that the U.S. was deprived of all the, that equipment. I mean, everything is made in China, even our pharmaceutical drugs. So the drugs that could be uh, needed to treat this, clinical trials, we have to wait on the supply chain from China. And it's, it's, it's helping to drive the anti-China resentment that Trump and the that Trump is kind of um, ginning up to deflect from his own failures. Um, but you also see the Democrats and many liberal elements uh, ramping up anti-China hysteria because they just are fundamentally anti-communist cold warriors who see China as a threat to U.S. hegemony. Well, as I said on uh, well, the, um, the, the, the question to the question of whether Bernie Sanders is going to win or if Biden will receive the nomination, as I said on my friend Jimmy Dore's show, the Democrats showed more discipline in defeating Bernie Sanders than they have against any Republican opponent in my lifetime. And uh, I think Bernie Sanders is effectively done. Um, part, it's partially his fault. He didn't really want to go on the attack against Joe Biden, someone he constantly identifies as his friend. It's a sort of a symptom we see in the Western left. Um, and we're seeing around, um, among a lot of people who supported Jeremy Corbyn, mm -hmm. where they're just sort of happy to stand aside and congratulate the establishment replacement for the person they supported, who in in your case, in the case of the UK, was really the victim of a very British coup. And in the US, 
Bernie Sanders was sort of the the victim of a calculated, I wouldn't say a, a rigged process, but a manipula manipulated process, um, as well as you know a media smear campaign that was increasing in intensity, which he really was reluctant to push back against. So Bernie Sanders will not be the nominee unless something extraordinary happens. The question that people here are debating is not a, is not that, but whether Joe Biden will be the nominee because he is so apparently mentally enfeebled that he's just simply unable to communicate with the American public at a time when they need not just clarity, but opposition to Trump. People really want to see someone out there, out there just hammering Trump and presenting an alternative to Trump's kind of uh, mean spiritedness and deceptiveness. And Biden isn't able to do it. He's just simply incapable of doing it. He makes Donald Trump look spry and charismatic. Um, and the only time you really see Biden in the U.S. is on social media. You'll see a clip of him, circulating of him making some embarrassing and really tragic gaffe. And it feels like when he's being interviewed, it feels like elder abuse. So people are wondering, you know, will the Democratic Party behind the scenes somehow replace him? It's not clear that there will be a Democratic or Republican convention. Um, it's not clear that the election will not be postponed. Um, no one knows what to expect right now. The funny thing is Biden is polling ahead of Trump in a lot of places. And the Democrats' plan, it's also it's sort of the plan of the national security state and those who really want to reestablish the U.S. as a stable empire, is to just kind of hide Biden, have him do as little as possible, take advantage of the fact that he doesn't have to campaign, and then just hope that everyone comes out and votes against Trump because they hate him so much, then they'll basically control Biden like this uh, marionette. Um, and Biden will be happy to go along with that because he is someone who is uh, very militaristic, imperial minded, uh, very inclined to let Wall Street set the agenda. So that's what I think. That's why th those are the choices we, re we face in the U.S. It's a really depressing choice. It's actually uh, sort of infuriating to watch. And I think it's part of what's driving this quiet process of radicalization. Uh, the question of, you know, what socialists do really relates to what everyone does. Because if you actually look at what Boris Johnson has been forced to do in the UK, he's actually co-opted large parts of Jeremy Corbyn's platform uh, to respond to coronavirus. Donald Trump in many ways is outflanking the Democrats who are saying, well, if we just open up the health care exchanges, uh, everyone who's uninsured who gets coronavirus will be OK. If you don't know what that is, and it's very um, anachronistic in the industrialized world, but the health exchanges are basically places where people, especially people of lower income, can sign up and get a slightly discounted health care rate where the U.S. taxpayer funds the healthcare industry, pri the private healthcare industry, to provide subpar healthcare at a slightly discounted rate, and it's now more expensive than ever. So the Democrats' plan was absolutely absurd. Hillary Clinton was complaining that Donald Trump wouldn't open up the health exchanges right now. But for most people, it didn't matter because if you're out of your job as an Uber driver or you know, busing tables at a restaurant. You can't afford to pay $350 a month just for your health insurance alone. If you have children, it could get up to $800. So what Donald Trump proceeded to do is say, if you get coronavirus, your health care will be free, free Medicare. Uh, he completely outflanked the Democrats from the left. And it shows that the only real solution to this crisis short of letting 1 million people die in the United States is to implement some measures that could be seen as objectively socialist. Um, the question for all people now is how is about their security, because there's a, the, the debate that's raging in the U.S., I don't, and, I'm, and I, I see it in the U.K. as well, is how soon people should be put back into the streets and put back to work and put into environments that are currently unsafe and potentially lethal, the workplace. And if, and, and, and it really feels like the pressure is coming from Donald Trump and from the elements around him because they want the economy to be roaring by election time. So the only power they have to assert themselves is as workers. 
once again, it's a very socialist uh, dynamic. And the power they have to assert themselves as workers would be through a general strike, which is sort of almost forbidden, um, at least in many American companies and many states, wildcat strikes are practically forbidden. But that's the choice that many people face, getting sick and possibly dying or refusing to go to work and actually organizing together so they can have an impact. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for people who identify as socialist. Um, and then beyond that, there's very clear educational opportunities here. I mean, there's so many lessons here about capitalism. And what I notice, just one final point, is you know among American liberals who really dominate the intelligentsia in American media, is that their critique of this crisis is to first of all um, equate falsely um, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Donald Trump as two authoritarians who created this crisis, uh, completely twisting the facts about what China actually did to buy time for the West. And then when they critique China, they talk about these various Chernobyl moments that are fundamental to the system of Chinese socialism that show how wrong it is. But the problem in the US, according to American liberals, is Donald Trump and Trump's incompetence. And what we face is a crisis of competence. If we just get some good technocrats in there who know what they're doing, everything will be fine. And it's act the, the, the reality is completely the reverse. We're facing a Chernobyl moment here in the US. And when you see long, long lines of cars backed up five hours in places like Pittsburgh, or when I just walk down the street, I can walk down the street for two blocks and see people lining up for trucks for food. That is a crisis of American capitalism. Capitalism is really the culprit here that has made this country, this gutted this country, and basically made it impotent to the point that it can't respond to this crisis at all. Yeah, you know, why was Maduro? Why was a fifteen million dollar bounty put on Maduro's head for the same reason that the coup against his elected government was launched in the first place um, last January? Regime change. The U.S. is desperate for regime change in Venezuela. It, it, Venezuela sits on the world's largest oil reserves. The U.S. has already stolen five billion dollars in assets from Venezuela in the past year. And U.S. corporations are desperate to sink their claws into the Venezuelan state, into its economy, and into its resources. So they have to get this government out of the way. And this is the latest ruse uh, where the U.S. has basically put into play a Panama-style scenario, uh, recalling the U.S. military operation to seize Manuel Noriega, former CIA asset turned president of Panama, and then launch a military intervention on Panama that killed some 4,000 people, then installing one of the most corrupt governments in the history of humanity, which had an approval rating of about 2% at its height. They turned Panama into basically a money laundering uh, haven. And uh, that's what they want to do to Venezuela. If you look at the Department of the Drug Enforcement Agency's own maps, the, in, the flow of cocaine traffic from South America to the U.S. comes directly from Colombia and goes to Florida and through Mexico and other places. It's Colombia that is the source of drug trafficking, of narco cartels, not Venezuela. And even the DEA, which put out this hit on Maduro and his associates, acknowledges that in their own material. So it can't even be taken seriously. But Colombia is America's bulwark. The United States is bulwark in South America. You could call it the Israel of South America. Its president is the protege of Alvaro Uribe, who was himself listed by the Drug Enforcement Agency as one of the top 80 drug traffickers in the world in the early 90s, because it was Uribe who was helping to provide Pablo Escobar with his flight licenses, making sure he had fields to take drugs to the US. It's just so obvious what a sham this is. And uh, Maduro, the president of Venezuela, issued a letter yesterday to the United States, to the people of the United States, asking them to help him stop a war that he fears could be inevitable. 
He said that I wholeheartedly ask you not to allow your country to be dragged once again into another unending conflict, another Vietnam, another Iraq, but this time closer to home. And it should be taken very seriously because Venezuela is not Panama. It's a country with a real military, a strong military, uh, with advanced Russian equipment. It's a country that has its government has strong popular support. There are two to three million people who have trained in part in popular militias known as colectivos, which are constantly demonized in U.S. media because they're in the way of empire. And it is a country that has allies throughout the region, including in Colombia. And an attack on Venezuela could uh, possibly reignite Colombia's civil war, destabilize the region, and lead to another catastrophic catastrophic migrant flow north. So it's really important to, while we have to take coronavirus seriously, it's important to see how the empire is trying to put new facts on the ground and move the ball while the rest of us are focused on saving our own lives. I mean, the end game is, I, I would say the end game is unlikely to be achieved, um, but it really is the end game of the oligarchy, which is to uh, remove all challenges to empire. I mean, empire is the ultimate realization of oligarchy. And the point of carrying out regime change operations against governments that are independent, that exist outside the sphere of U.S. control, is to allow multinational corporations and international finance to exploit their economies and people. Um, that's why the U.S. is why, why, for example, the U.S. has 30 to 40,000 troops in South Korea. Um, and it's also to prevent South Korea from having a popular government. Um, so we can look at Syria, North Korea, even the gathering Cold War on China. It's about U.S. hegemony. And in, in U.S. hegemony is about financial control over the world. And one of the real the emerging um, I think what's at the top of the agenda of every country that is under U.S. sanctions, um, according to Venezuelan researchers, one third of the world's population lives under U.S. sanctions in one form or another. But what's at the top of their agenda is a new financial system that allows them to become independent from the dollar because it's the dollar and the power of the dollar that allows the U.S. to crush economies by cutting them off. And when a country is sanctioned, like Venezuela is, it's, and its economy becomes cut off from the world financial system and it can't use the swift financial exchange, for example, it's unable to obtain the assets it needs to buy medicine or food for its people. Um, you know, and these are countries where the you know, a population of people living in poverty is 30, 40, 50 percent, and so people die. And we've seen since the U.S. imposed sanctions on Venezuela beginning in 2015, at least 40,000 people die in the first two years of the sanctions, according to the Center for Economic and Pol Policy Research. But the number of deaths is probably much higher. These are what are, are known as excess deaths um, because people die silently. They die of hunger. They die of sickness. They die of alcoholism. They die of desperation, uh, trying to leave. That's what sanctions are doing to Iran. And so when we hear people say, oh, these sanctions are only targeting the corrupt leadership, it's just, it just rings hollow. It's completely false because they are aiming to, I mean, the, the, the real goal, and we've actually you know, heard leaders um, say this in much more private settings, is to impose pain on the civilian population in this delusional hope that they'll rise up against their own governments. It's going to take a long time for people outside of our you know, more uh, informed anti-war circles to understand that sanctions are actually an act of war. You can get 500,000 people out in the streets in the US to rally against a conventional war where Americans might die and where you'll see actual atrocities, planes bombing, homes filled with multiple families and you know, burning children 
But with sanctions, it's a silent killer, and it's going to take a long time for people to really understand how devastating it is and uh, to then ultimately campaign for their illegalization. These should be banned. I think a good start is Antonio Guterres, uh, the UN general secretary's call for a global cease.